Welcome to the Supernatural Track here at Continual. I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin, and tonight we are doing the road trip for season six. We are looking at the locations that were used fictionally in the series and why those were picked, why, why those and not others, what happened there, what were they thinking, and maybe even a little bit about where did they actually shoot this and pretend it was somewhere else. But before we get into that, let's let our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting with Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Stokes. I've been a fan of Supernatural since season three. I started writing fanfic in 2012, and uh, I, I love coming to panels and talking about Supernatural. Anna. I'm Anna Kenzing. I am an author. I write queer um, romance, mostly MM, and I've been a fan of Supernatural since the beginning and have dabbled a bit in fanfic and I just really love being on these panels too. Okay, Beth. Hi, I am Beth Dolmer. I write paranormal fiction and nonfiction. Um, so my work is very much influenced by uh, all the years of Supernatural I've watched, I tuned in the very first night the pilot episode aired, and I have been hooked ever since. Wow. Electra. I'm Electra Hammond. I'm a writer and an editor, and I, too, was there that very first night that the pilot aired, and I've been there ever since. Michelle. I am Michelle Crowley. I am a lecturer of communication studies, and also I... Uh, dabble in not fanfic but academic writing about supernatural okay and i'm gail c martin and morgan bryce as gail i write epic and urban fantasy is morgan i write uh urban fantasy male male paranormal romance but all of my modern worlds are ones where sam and dean could walk in and feel right at home i'm the new kid on the block i didn't fall in love with the show until it was halfway through season 11 and then i binged 11 seasons in four months so that i could catch up for the start of season 12. so what i lacked in in long history i think i have made up for an enthusiasm at least i tried to so <laughs> season six this was the transition season between Kripke and Sarah Gamble picking up. We had some odd plot arcs with the Campbell family and soulless Sam and Dean finding out that Sam actually wasn't still in the cage. So there, there were a lot of um, a lot of interesting loose ends in this season and that leads to some of the places they went. So let's start with what are your top two places that they they visited, Carol? Well, the one that we spend the most episodes on, 10 episodes of this season, at some point, we are in Sioux Falls. So we spend a lot of time this season at Bobby's house, um, which is great because it's such a great location. They have this big old house and they've got the salvage yard and, um, you know, his place is all crammed with all these books and everything. It's a place that the boys spent some time on at various points in their childhood. Uh, so it's a really interesting place to be. And in particular for Weekend at Bobby's, of course, we spend the entire episode there, uh, minus a brief, you know, look at where the boys are at when they're off somewhere else. Um, we get to see Bobby in his natural habitat, uh, functioning as he does when he's not out on a hunt with a, the Winchesters, where he's got his phone bank, you know, here's the FBI phone and here's, uh, you know, U.S. Marshal's phone and here's, here's all these different phone lines. Um, and we see how he's very comfortable there but at the same time, how he's dealing with so many things all at once. He's got, you know, Jody knocking on the door. They're looking for somebody and somebody else who thinks he's got a dead body. And then Rufus does have a dead body and needs help getting rid of it. And, you know, Sam and Dean are calling in saying, we've got this monster we don't know what to do with. And then he's got this cute neighbor coming over trying to give him a peach cobbler. Uh, and so 
in his very relaxed, homey setting, we see that Bobby is a very busy, busy man. That poor neighbor in the peach cobbler. I mean, it doesn't oh, work. It out didn't well. end well. It did not end well at all. And I felt, I felt so bad for her. She tried so hard. And then there she is in her little white nighty uh, with blood all over her from the wood chipper. And Bobby's just like, uh, so how about dinner? And she's like, I don't think so. <laughs> And if you were traumatized by a wood chipper from far, from the movie Fargo, which was in North Dakota, you are from this episode, which was in South Dakota. If you're in the Dakotas, steer clear of the wood chippers. That's just all I've got to say. We actually, at one point here in Connecticut, had a famous murder case called the wood chipper murder because the guy, like I think was a lawyer, killed his wife, put her through the wood chipper. <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah, headlines for, for weeks, wood chipper murder. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> well, you know, they pull a lot of, of inspiration from real things. They do. So. But so I just really loved spending all this time in Bobby's house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really, I really enjoyed that. It To me, it really made it very grounded for him and for Sam and Dean, because this is a base they're used to operating from. And I can't tell you in fan fiction how many stories have the boys living there at various times, before, during, after hunting, you know, all these different eras uh, where they're living with Bobby and it is their base. So yeah, I really enjoyed that we spent a lot of time there this season. And he had perfected using power equipment to get rid of bodies. I mean, you got to respect that. Oh, didn't he have the backhoe to, to you know, and Rufus was like, yeah, this is really cool. <laughs> yeah, let's get a backhoe. We can bury those bodies, no problem. <laughs> and then they had to dig it up and move it. So <laughs> You have a body in the basement. I have a body in the yard. Yeah. So <laughs> My body tops your body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a great episode. <laughs> Anna, you're, you're muted. So we do spend a lot of time in Sioux Falls at Bobby's place, but we spend a fair bit of time also in the two cities that Lisa and Ben Braden live in, starting out in Cicero, Indiana, where um, Dean met them. And so we pick up the season in Cicero at Lisa's house where Dean is, you know, recovering from, <laughs> the events of Swan Song and has spent the last year, you know, pretending to be a suburban, you know, partner and dad, you know, working construction, you know, teaching the kid how to play ball and also, you know, drawing devil straps underneath the, you know, welcome mat into the house and drinking a bunch of whiskey. <laughs> so, um, and then they have to move, right? So, um, they end up moving from Cicero um, to uh, after the events of the first episode when the Jinn are there to take revenge on Dean for what Sam and Dean had done to the, you know, Jinn's family member, whatever. And so then they move to Battle Creek, Michigan. So we have a couple episodes in Battle Creek, Michigan in the new house where Dean is trying to let Lisa and Ben have as normal of a life as they can have when you know they're living with a hunter who is not entirely sure that he wants to stop hunting or keep hunting um so you know that was a significant location um and then i think my also um possible favorite is um just the very very brief moments we spend in scotland at crowley's gravesite and recall from season one that dean is afraid to fly and so that must have been a really uncomfortable long flight for both Sam and Dean to get to the Highlands <laughs> for to to collect uh, Crowley's bones so that they can be used against him as a threat. That requires humming a lot of Metallica. A lot of Metallica, and I mean Metallica is prolific, right? Like forty years of a career, like there's pro there's enough, there's enough to hum, but but yeah, it does require humming a lot of Metallica. Could Castiel, could Castiel have zapped them over? I mean, it like it seems like he could have, but then I think at the end of the episode, um, 
Castiel or no or Bobby one of them like thanks Sam and Dean for flying there and so uh, the fact that they flew there was specifically mentioned um because yeah like and I think I think Dean would have preferred it if Castiel had sat them there but Castiel turns out to be less of a friend to the Winchesters in this season than in previous seasons so. it would have been more under the radar if they flew there than if Castiel was snapping them around yeah well, and besides that, it gives Dean constipation. So true. Yeah, that's so, the episode I, don't know. I want to see is Dean on an airplane for eight hours. <laughs> right? Like Dean on an airplane for eight hours versus the constipation he gets when Castiel's at some, you know, places yeah. like which would he really prefer? Like if you put a gun to his head and said, pick one, I don't know which one of you pick. Did the writer of that episode remember that Dean gets is afraid of flying. I think they forgot. That's that's another, you know, detail. Yeah, yeah. I think they forgot. I just picture him stalking up and down the the uh, corridor um, and getting put back in his seat and stalking up and down the corridor because I can't imagine unless he's in baby sitting still for that long. Yeah, yeah. Or, and he's or trying or to hit on the well, maybe Sam dosed him. Maybe Sam dosed him. And he's <laughs> trying, to, uh, trying to hit on the, the with flight uh, attendant. With some Xanax or something. Right? Well, she's he, trying to hit on the flight attendant, but he's not really like at his best. And so she's not really being responsive. And, you know, so yeah. No well, bile hide. No bile There is plenty of scotch. <laughs> it's true. This You're is true. Really good single malt on board. The, that, that, no that but the, but the bottles are small, so small, and we're in season six by now, right? Like Dean needs more than just like two or three of these little bottles, right? Like this is just a, a moose bush for for Dean, right? So well, he he admits when in the episode where they tell the truth to the guy at the uh, mental institution, and of course get committed, um, and or maybe it's the one with the ray. Anyhow, somebody asks him how many drinks he has a week, and he he thinks for a minute and then says fifty. 52? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, that's a lot of airline bottles. A lot of airline bottles. And I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure the plane has as many as he would need or that the flight attendants would give him as many as he needed. Yeah. This is true. Beth? I mean, I'm the same as Carol and Anna. I, I love being at Bobby's house. And Weekend at Bobby's is probably one of my top 10 favorite Supernatural episodes because um, I just love that glimpse into his life. And I, one of the things I really like about Bobby's house is that it is simultaneously homey, but also spooky. Um, I feel like, you know, the first time we see Bobby's house, it was like, okay, well, you know, is the person that lives here going to come out and hand the boys a cup of tea or try to kill them with a chainsaw? It's kind of that sort of like, I don't, I don't know how to feel about this place. But obviously seeing Bobby and, and, and inhabiting his space it made it feel more and more like home the more and more we saw it on screen. So I always love a chance to get to be there at his house. Um, probably another location I really love is the French mistake because it's it's such a meta episode. So it's it's a destination in the sense that they're on a soundstage, but in terms of the storyline, they haven't really gone anywhere because they're just there where they go to work every day. Um, and I just love the scenes that are at, at that alternate universe Sam's house um, because the house is so big and ostentatious and it's got that the art of himself on the walls and just it, the awkwardness and the shock that Sam has being in that house and be like, I, I live here, this is mine, I'm married to who? Um, I just I just think everything about that, those scenes in that house are just great fun and they picked a great um, setting for, for that kind of a reaction. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And, and also now knowing that he didn't know Genevieve was going to bring one of their real wedding pictures and put it on the mantle until <laughs> like the scene. And there it is, you know, you married fake Ruby? Well, yes, I guess I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Electra. Um, the Campbell compound. I don't know where it really is, but I, I love that the Campbell family has a compound and it, it's bigger on the inside than on the outside. I mean, it's not quite as big as Bobby's house. It doesn't have that room of requirement feel to it. <laughs> But, you know, it's got the hidden library and it does seem to have a couple of extra rooms tucked in there, more so than you would think on the outside. And it's how they, they find out about Sunrise, Wyoming and end up there. I 
I think it's meant to be in Lansing, Michigan, which I thought was sort of interesting that Dean was willing to relocate Lisa and Ben, you know, sort of close-ish to the Campbell compound, which, because at that point he wasn't entirely sure that he trusted his newly risen from the dead grandfather and all of these cousins that he's never met before. So, but yeah, but I, but according to the Supernatural Wiki, I think the Campbell compound is meant to be in Lansing. Okay. Yeah, there's a strange fascination with Michigan. I still haven't gotten my answer on Pontiac. So, uh, or actually that was Pontiac, Illinois. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely but, too close for comfort to the Campbells. Well, he does know that the Campbells have a, a family history of, of hunting. He didn't get that from newly risen grandpa. He got that from grandpa before he was dead. Yeah. By virtue of having met him the first go round. This is true. Michelle. I'm going to take a step back when we were talking about Castiel zapping people places and talk about Sunrise, Wyoming. And even though that it, it's, you know, one of those kind of one-off episodes and it's, it's not exactly the, the place you can travel to by, you know, by baby in today's world. Uh, but just seeing the, you know, the old West town and then also having Dean in his element, well, he thinks in his absolute element and he just is geeking out over everything. And then he, you know, has a unfortunate realization when it comes to the bar and, and the girls and whatnot but so and, and also it's it's kind of one of those um episodes where sorry my my cat's not happy i'm talking uh it's kind of one of those episodes where it, it, a lot of the procedural or serial dramas and such always end up having a, a western episode of some sort and you know fortunately supernatural got to give us that in in season six um, but yeah, see, seeing just the old West town and I don't know where I was going with that. I had it all planned out in my head and then my cat distracted me. So that's, uh, that's what he does. <sighs> I really love the scene when they're, you know, Sam has to go off. He has to go ride the horse and go find, you know, Samuel Colt and then come back. And you just have that, you know, here's that flat line, you know, and there he is riding along the horizon. You know, and it's only like this big because the horizon is so huge, you know, and then like horizon riding back, you know, <laughs> just to give us a, an idea of the uh, the vastness of the area. And and we have seen Jared ride in Walker, so we do know that sometime between season six and now he has learned to ride a horse. I didn't feel nearly as bad for the horse in Walker. Um, well, they so, got the right size horse for him for Walker. Well, that's true. We got him a little horse for this, just to make him look, just to make it look silly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just watching yeah. him go across the horizon was very painful. <laughs> I was intrigued in the two episodes that we had the boys in New Jersey because I think that if Dean got a chance to spend a little more time in New Jersey, he'd find that while he doesn't really like big cities he's really a Jersey boy at heart. There's, there's a lot of Dean that I think would fit in New Jersey. Hmm. Um, the attitude, the jacket, I mean, you know, um, when you're a jet, you're a jet. Uh, you know, I think, I, I think he could be a Jersey boy if he tried. So I was kind of intrigued. We don't get to see them in big cities very often. And while those were not necessarily New York, they're bigger than a lot of the places that the boys go and big city adjacent because um, pretty much that's all of New Jersey. Um, so I, I was intrigued with that. And I, on one hand, there's the fish out of water that they're not in the Midwest anymore. On the other hand, I think given half a chance, both of them could fit pretty well. So round two, uh, back to you, Carol. Uh, I'm going to comment on what you were just saying that um, I know the last couple of seasons, I believe last season in particular, was very, very little, little towns, really tiny towns, you know, often not even called a town anymore, <laughs> but a village or something. So, uh, you know, very, very small 
towns where I found this season was much more in bigger cities. We had a lot of larger cities here. Um, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, Buffalo, you know, Lansing, um, Portland, Oregon, uh, you know, Sandusky, Ohio. I mean, a lot of these cities are really good sized cities, like several, several thousands of people. Um, as opposed to the little, oh, this town has 1,500 people. Now they do have one town, oh, in Caged Heat, they had a town of 28 people. <laughs> so that was the all time smallest, but uh, most of these are like 25,000 people and up, uh, which was a different kind of setting, uh, I think for the boys, much less rural, much less, uh, you know, that small town where almost they could blend in easier. Um, but here they were in the bigger cities, but they were in kind of those, uh, like in New Jersey and they're like in warehouses and stuff. And they're not in those big central populated areas. They're kind of in these around the edges areas, but still of these uh, much larger metropolitan areas than they've been in the past. Okay. Anna? Yeah, and they also um, take a detour to San Francisco um, in the dragon mm -hmm. episode, like a virgin, in order to talk to Dr. Um, Visiak, who is, um, you know, the dragon specialist and has had a past relationship with Bobby. And then, oh, right, turns out to have been a denizen of purgatory and the means by which the gate to purgatory is opened. Um, but I think that probably, you know, the next town or the next location I wanted to talk about was Bristol, Rhode Island. Um, so, you know, like, again, we're mostly in the season, mostly in the Midwest, we're mostly in, you know, South, the Dakotas, Michigan, you know, um, Western Pennsylvania, you know, sort of Midwesty kinds of places. But then we do have a couple locations on the coast in Oregon and in San Francisco, and then Bristol, Rhode Island, which we only see that it only, it's only set on one episode, but it apparently has, they've been there twice, right? So Bristol, Rhode Island is a, a place that Sam was there with Samuel while he was soulless. And, um, you know, they were hunting an arachne who was taking men in their thirties and poisoning them. And so we didn't see th that happen initially, but then we see Sam and Dean after Sam gets his soul back return to Bristol, Rhode Island. And it turns out that Sam doesn't remember it, but everybody else in Bristol, Rhode Island does remember it. And that it is a trap for Sam because all of the women that Sam has had sex with the last time that he was there have now been taken by the arachne and turned into spider monsters themselves. So this is our <laughs> one of the multiple examples of Sam's pain of death. A pain of when death. it didn't die per se, but they did get turned into monsters. And so still here we are season six and having sex with <laughs> Sam is a dicey proposition at best. This is true. This is true. Beth? You know, we're talking about these locations ranging from New Jersey and Rhode Island all the way over to California and Oregon. And I feel like the real star location of this season is not an actual town, but baby herself, because that car seems to magically get them places in a record amount of time. And I don't think there is anybody who crisscrosses the country as much as Sam and Dean do. And I just, the idea of like, oh, we need to go talk to this guy in San Francisco. Let's just pop over there. <laughs> you know, putting all those miles and all those days on the car for like a, a one hour encounter with somebody. Um, I, I have always been amused at how much driving they do. And obviously how much time in the car is spent that we don't see as viewers. Um, but I think this season with the, the varied locations really highlights that fact that that car just gets them all kinds of places. And um, yeah, I just, it's almost like a, a little magic transporter that seems to get them everywhere in a record amount of time. Beth, I don't know if you've ever lived in the Midwest or the West, but that's not really that strange of a mindset when you live in the middle of nowhere. The Oh, let's go for a movie. It's 45 minutes. So what? We'll just drive an hour. And it 
the time periods get longer the further west you go. If you're in Texas, it's like, oh, there's a good restaurant. It's only two hours one way. We can have dinner and make a night of it. Um, so for, for Midwest boys, that's maybe not as crazy as for folks who are used to having their world very compact and nearby. Um, I'm showing my big city, uh, <laughs> my big city life here. <laughs> Yeah, because there is nothing closer than 45 minutes to an hour. So grocery shopping, movies, good restaurant, kind of have to go. <laughs> Michelle's nodding. We've, we've apparently both been in the small towns. So that, although I do think the Winchesters are an extreme, uh, except for maybe long distance truckers. Um, but yeah, um, parts of it are not that crazy, but yeah, they definitely take it to an extreme. Electra, how about you? young too yeah. Um, yeah you're willing to when i was much younger than i am I think we lost Electra. Electra, we can't hear you. Mm -mm. I don't think she can hear us. You might want to log out and log back in again. Ah, there we go. Maybe. Um, Michelle, how about you? Well, so I am from the Midwest. Um, I'm from this little state called Kentucky. And even though we don't really most people don't consider that the Midwest. Uh, I do because that whole mindset of, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's just a 45 minute drive one way to go to Walmart is just, that's just what we do. Um, so the, the one city that I really kind of took a liking to because I, I see my own small town America is Elwood, Indiana from Clap Your Hands. And just the, just the, the whole small town vibe of that city, the people, you know, you, you have in a small city like that, you've got your glue sniffers, you have the ones that took the brown acid, you have the ones that, you know, it, the, um, the attorney, the, the one that Dean gets arrested over uh, assaulting, kind of like, don't want to say it, but in, in the mindset of, of small town America, especially Indiana, like that type of is an anomaly like there would be a reason that it would be seen as an immediate hate crime if anything would happen to you know someone um, of not just that stature but also that stature mm -hmm. sorry not sorry um so just just kind of seeing my own experience of midwest america small town and also right outside town cornfields everywhere and it doesn't matter which direction you go, there's cornfields for miles. And who knows what happens in those cornfields? You know, they, 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 teenagers go out there and have some alone time. The aliens come down and abduct you. Uh, you know, you set up your camp of, of aliens, hunters, whatnot. They're all out there, or so we think. So, yeah, El, El, I think it was Elwood, Indiana. And actually, that it's a real, it's a real city, and it's about two hours from where I live. Uh, north-ish so it's uh could potentially go visit and according to google there's like eight thousand people that live there and that city is about the same size as the one in which i currently reside yeah i you know something that intrigued me in um this season and also last season uh when you look at where some of these things some of the episodes were actually shot in canada is they were shot in a lot of play, in a lot of episodes on the Watchmen set, which was being filmed at the same time. Um, the episode, The End, was, was shot on the Watchmen set. Um, 
so many times when they needed someplace that looked like it had been bombed, they used the Watchman set. And I'm always so intrigued when they're able to reuse a set or a location and <clears throat> probably not have everybody in the audience going, oh, I know where you're shooting that. They can make it different enough that it, it isn't just a repeat. And so kudos as always to the set designer for Supernatural, but also I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with reusing that set. The other one that I thought was really interesting was, um, yeah, Electra, I did, I did let you in, honest, really. Um, can someone text Electra, please, and let her know, um, as far as I'm concerned, she's in. Um, so anyhow, the other one that really intrigues me is um, Riverview Mental Hospital which is actually set at a real place and not a, um, that's in 610, um, in caged heat and not in, you know, something dressed up to look like an old hospital. So since those are extremely, always extremely creepy locations uh, in my book, uh, I'm always fascinated when they find a place that they can use, even if it's just, even if they're not inside, even if they're just standing outside, um because you know those places have real ghosts and um i'd love to i just love that kind of mesh between fiction and reality well we're still trying to get electric back but um round three what haven't we talked about yet carol um this one for me is not so much the town that they set it in which is chester pennsylvania but it's the motel so this is the episode, My Heart Will Go On. And they stay at the White Star Motel. And I mean, and I've read a ton of stuff about the Titanic. Like it was just one of those really fascinating things. So, you know, I watched a bunch of documentaries, read a bunch of stuff. Never dawned on me until today that the White Star Motel, the White Star is the name of the shipping line that the Titanic was part of. It was the white, white star shipping. And I just was like, how did I not ever realize that? Uh, and then I just thought it was hilarious, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what a great little detail, you know, to put in there. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it. And if you did, then you're just like, you know, amused as I was immensely. Um, I, that's the kind of thing that they I love when they do the things with the motels. Sometimes it's the decor. Um, we had another motel when they're, um, where are they? Uh, oh, all dogs go to heaven and they're in Buffalo. So they're right by the falls. And so the, the motel is over the barrel motel because it's for the people who are in the barrels going down the falls and stuff. And I, you know, they must just have a blast naming these things, which is kind of amusing because if I'm writing a story, I'm like trying to think I'm like, what's some kind of really cute name I can give the motel, damn it. <laughs> you know, but then I see them on the show and I just, of course it seems effortless. You know, of course it was the White Star Motel. What else are you gonna call it? You know, the lifeboat in, I mean, I guess you could, but you know, so yeah, uh, those two motels I thought were really, really cute names. And um, really, I just was like, how did you not see that? <laughs> and which was the one that was the barrel? The barrel was All Dogs Go to Heaven, set mm -hmm. in Buffalo. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, over the barrel motel because of all the people who would try to go over the falls in, in barrel. And of course, we're back in Buffalo again, which is yeah. one of the most visited cities, fictionally at least, in the series. Why? Does anybody visit Buffalo that often? Well, he does have one of his, John's, one of his uh, storage units is there. Castle so Street. yeah, yeah. Clearly they liked it for some reason. They never tell us where other of his units are. That would be really amusing to find. To, to, you know, like, where were the rest of them? I mean, he had to have a few scattered around. He couldn't have them all at one point because he'd have to go there all the time, you know. He surely had one in Kansas. Mm -hmm. 
and I suspect he probably had one in like the mid south, like yeah, the you Carolina, much, yeah. Kentucky, and then maybe like something one, like that. One out west, you know, right? Just kind of yeah, yeah, so. right? Like one, yeah. So so yeah, so one in Kansas, which would also cover going into Oklahoma and. Um, but yeah, probably one in Colorado. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> Buffalo is, yeah, I don't know why Buffalo. I mean, I've been to Buffalo before. It's fine, right? It's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> but I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like it's big enough to get lost oh, yeah. in, but it's not like, but it's small enough to sort of um, not come to the attention of the authorities, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. How about you, Beth? I actually have a question for you guys instead of an answer. <laughs> okay. So we've been talking about, you know, the, the small towns and then having some of the larger cities that are in season six. So I have a question for all of you, which is, is there something about small towns that are creepier and spookier than setting these stories in a larger city? Oh, totally. Absolutely. You know, I had, a, I had a discussion at a convention once with a couple of urban fantasy authors, one of whom wrote a lot of stuff set in like New York, and one of whom kind of specialized in the small town gothic. And we talked about how the scare factor is different. In big cities, it's the anonymity. It's the idea that any, you can be anybody in a big city. You can lose your identity. Um, everybody's a stranger. And because everybody's a stranger, nobody really cares. And uh, just the sheer size and number of places to hide and how nobody knows you so you can be anything. In a small town, it's kind of the reverse in that everybody knows you. Everybody knows your business. You can't lose your identity even if you want to. People put identities on you and there are all kinds of secrets and scandals and, and hidden things that people just don't want to talk about. So they know too much. And that, that's kind of the root of it. So it, it's interesting that that's the way supernatural often goes with the small towns because it's a whole different, very personal level of horror. It's, it's also, it sort of depends on the thing that's, that's, that you're setting up to be scary, right? So I actually split my time between New York City and a very small coastal village in Maine, which is, you know, like one of the least populated states in the country. And um, things that I'm scared of are different in New York City and in Maine. And in New York City, I'm, I'm scared of sort of like crime related things um, being mugged, you know, being attacked, like being pushed onto the subway tr tracks and getting run over by a train. But what I'm not really afraid of in New York City is ghosts and um, witches and specters of all kinds and ghouls. But I'm telling you, like in my, my coastal main village is adorable. And everybody that I meet in the daylight here is super friendly and super nice. I know the postmistresses by name. I live next door to town hall. The clerks of town hall are super friendly. Everything is just delightful here. But there's a lot more space here between houses and it's a lot darker. And the houses are old and it's entirely, and there's a lot of like abandoned spaces. So particularly in my, in my town and my immediate surrounding town, there's a, there was a huge granite industry here um, in the uh, early 19th, late 18th and early 19th century. And so, and most of those quarries have been abandoned. And so there's plenty of room for evil spirits and monsters and things like that to be like coming out of the abandoned granite quarry in this town <laughs> so the fear is is a little bit different I feel okay. like, the, like the spirit of supernatural exists because of the small towns and you know that's that was the original premise you know even uh, back in the Kripke days of traveling the back roads and encountering all of these American urban legends and I I've never lived in a big city i've lived adjacent but not actually you know in, in so I, I can't i can't really say from my own experience but 
or rather I am saying this from my own experience, that I don't feel like that there are a lot of those urban legends, you know, the, 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 my one that's close to me is a um, an old slaughterhouse where there's a portal to hell. You know, you don't hear about that kind of stuff in New York City. Right. But it's it's so much more prevalent out here where there are a lot of abandoned spaces and there is a lot of open space. And I know a lot of people with wood chippers and backhoes. And, you know, you just kind of have to wonder sometimes. You know, wood chipper. Hi, you all know me. <laughs> We're all going to stay on your good side, Electra, and welcome back. Um, I will be right back to you in a second. Um, you know, when I did my, um, when I did my graduate work at Penn State, it is in the middle of Pennsylvania and there is nothing around it. And I had, because it was kind of equidistant from the coasts, we had a lot of folks who were from New York City and they, you know, they were okay in our small little college town that, that had everything very walkable and it was very cute and it had all the little, you know, bistros and, and, uh, and shops, but I remember driving uh, out of the town with one of my friends from New York, and I noticed that he had like this white knuckle grip on the <laughs> the armrest, and it's like, what's what's the matter? And he said, I, "People out here kill you. I, I you know, <laughs> this is dangerous. I've I've never been here. This is very scary." Uh, and and it was, you know, here's a guy who perfectly at home in New York City, but don't put him out in Northwestern, you know, in, in Central Western, uh, Central Northern PA, because too many trees, too darn many farms, and too much space. We were talking about the corn, yes. Like we were talking about the difference in what there is to be afraid of in small towns versus cities. Well, one of the things we've talked about before when we talk about the settings in small towns is especially, Carol, you have often gone above and beyond checking their research. And it always checks out that there's some place in the area that they may have based whatever scary thing they're doing on. And they've been pretty much spot on about doing a good job with the research. And that's, that's really, really important because they have these crazy ass fans like us who check into this stuff. And who notice that if they're in a certain city or a certain town, that they're not getting the character of the town right. Um, I'm reading through stuff for the Hugo Awards. And one of the stories is set in a particular town up near Ithaca, where I spent many years living. And I kept getting pulled out of the story by things like, wait, no, there are no trailer parks in that area. No, they wouldn't be living someplace like that. So when people get it wrong, you notice and it bothers you. So you know, it was funny. I saw um, a story that was actually supernatural fanfic. And what really excited me was that it was set in my small town. Now, nothing is ever set in my hometown. Um, nothing except the stuff I've written. Nobody writes about Meadville, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's way up in that corner. The, the little corner of Pennsylvania that goes up to Lake Erie, it's, it's there. Um, so I contacted the author and I said, I am really excited that you've set this in Meadville. I'm, I'm from there. What made, you, what made you think of it? Be thinking, hey, maybe this is another hometown person. And she said, well, I needed a town in Eastern Pennsylvania. Whoa, whoa. Eastern Pennsylvania is eight hours away. And it's New Jersey. I mean, that thing is a very long state. This is someone who can't read a map, clearly. Yeah. Meadville is up here, Eastern Pennsylvania is over here. And oh my God. <laughs> yeah, and Eastern New Pennsylvania Coast. is basically New Jersey. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. yeah it's, it's right again, that, we're close to it's, the cannon. It's that <laughs> dumb, dumb idea of, well, I'm from Kentucky, therefore, all small towns must have. A trailer park in them that kind of thing and that's what i was hitting in this short story which is a great short story otherwise but that area of new york is not like that because what's up there is dairy farms mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and well colleges. folks we have gone through our time really quickly does <laughs> anybody have another location here before we do our wrap up that we haven't gotten to okay please tell me that you got to providence no, 
talk okay. about Providence, please. I, I do want to shout out that um, Providence is where H.P. Lovecraft spent most of his life and did his writing and that it's an important location for him. So even though it was a flashback, I was glad to see they did their Lovecraft research because there's even a convention every oh. year in Providence that's based on, on H.P. Lovecraft fandom, um, Necronomicon. And it's good that they at least got that right. Because, you know, Lovecraft is Lovecraft and we all love Cthulhu if nothing else. We hate his creator, but we do love Cthulhu. <laughs> this is this is true. Yeah, and I'll just add yeah. that we get a uh, Biggerson's restaurant in Calumet City, Illinois, and um, this isn't the first time that we have seen Biggerson's. It comes in in the, a couple of the previous seasons, but in the next season, we get a lot more of Biggerson's restaurant. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're sort of setting that up in um, in this season, which is really kind of delightful. Yeah. Like you they know, probably, I think they probably didn't even realize at the time that they were going to create something that they would be like later. Oh, wow! Look how we can use this, and it became like an actual, you know, plotting device in, in the, the later seasons. But yeah, exactly. Since we know that, back, go ahead. We're, we're back to the we need a family restaurant, but we don't want to use something branded, so we need to come up with a name. Yeah. That so they and, came up with something and then kept using it and they used it for years and years and years the infamous they all look the same so we can't tell them apart which castiel uses to his advantage yeah mm -hmm. well, well, and just like a denny's all denny's mm -hmm. look alike mm -hmm. you always yeah, know well, what the bathroom is at the denny's because you've been to one yeah well, what I would have loved to have seen them do with the Biggersons is, has anybody heard of the Waffle House Index? The Waffle House, Waffle House is a chain of <laughs> breakfast right. places that right. is everywhere, especially except in New Africa. England. Yeah, it, 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 you have to be like below the Mason Dixon line to find the Waffle House. But okay. they are open 24 seven. And if they ever close, the National Weather Service takes note of it. Because Waffle House, the Waffle House Index is a storm warning. So I would have loved to have seen like the Biggerson's Index during the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> okay, I really know things are bad because Biggerson's closed. They really uh, missed it on that one. They sh absolutely <laughs> should have. That would have been there's great. There's one everywhere. In the Southeast, yeah. No, the Biggerson's is, is ubiquitous oh. through the series. <laughs> they absolutely should have done that. <laughs> That's one they missed. And, yeah. and you should point this out to them because they're doing a prequel. That's right. Apocalypse yeah, preparedness. The prequel, like the prequel, the prequel, so they use your idea. The prequel might predate Biggerson's though. They were oh, always oh. just because or they, there's only or maybe no. there's only one bigger sins because it's like the first one and it hasn't oh, franchised yeah. yet. It's still mom and pop, they're not corporate yeah. yet. I yeah. like where this is going. <laughs> Well, folks, we have blown through our time. Was there anything else anybody was dying to bring up? I was struck by uh, what what something that Electra was saying about how so many of the places in the past episodes actually had something in the area to tie it to. This season, I didn't see that. I actually did not see that. It was not I did not find those little tiny nuggets of like, oh, look, there really was a psychiatric hospital or, you know, this kind of thing. And I wonder if that is the difference between the end of the Kripke area, area, area and era, <laughs> <laughs> and the beginning of the Gamble era, where Kripke was so heavily invested in that premise and you know, striving to really sink those roots deep in, whereas uh, Sarah Gamble taking over the show was probably just like, we need arcs and, and we need to do things and, and everything and did not necessarily get to those roots. And that's why maybe we're not in so many small towns this season, but we're in the bigger, uh, the bigger cities and everything because they didn't have the time or recourse to, yeah. to find those little tiny nuggets that have been just so juicy in our earlier road trips. 
And that we're spending so much more time in a place, right? In Bobby's right. Right. place, Bobby's house. Right. In Bobby's Bobby's house. He's got the room of requirements to see right. right. where it had all the things we needed. And we'll see this. We'll see this in the future, right? When we settle into the bunker. And, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you know. definitely. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what struck me about Bobby's house, especially in Weekend at Bobby's, was there were rooms in it we hadn't seen before and never saw again. You got this idea it was this little tiny salt box, you know, maybe a bungalow. And then wait, whoa, where did that room come from? And where did so the other I think, room come from? I remember so seeing it as like kind of like a big rambly two-story yeah. place, you know. It's but... all, all those rooms are underground. Yeah, that's it. They're, yeah, they're, like they're, the next, they're next to the safe room <laughs> and, and you know the panic room. It's the singer TARDIS. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he's, he's got that backhoe. Yes. So he expanded underground. Well, you know, he built the panic room in a weekend, so it's possible. Uh, I have nothing to do. <laughs> Folks, let's go around and let everybody know where they can find you, starting with Michelle. You can find me on Twitter at Preheating Prof. All right. Beth? Uh, you can find me at bethdoldner.com and there are links there to all of my social media handles. Great, Electra? Untilmidnight.com. Uh, that's got all the links to where to find me. And Anna? At annakensing.com and on TikTok at Anna Kensing Books. Carol? I'm not so streamlined as the rest of you yet. <laughs> I'm on Facebook as Carol Stokes, where you can find me on the TFWNC group and also in the continual group. On um, Twitter, I am true underscore fire sign 10, and all of my fiction is on AO3 under fire sign 10. And I'm pretty easy to find at galesymartin.com, morganbrice.com, all of the social media is a variation of those. I do run the Supernatural TFWNC group, but most of the time I'm here on continual. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There'll be more Supernatural coming up on Continuum, so we'll see you online.